Another thing I want to, uh, to uh, give you a little notice about is that we are looking forward to what's going on as we head now into the fall and tentatively we are planning on the 15th of September, Saturday the 15th, which is about what, five or six weeks from now, we're planning on having a friend day. And I want to encourage you to think of a friend who probably is not normally a person who goes to church anywhere, or even it could be somebody who does go to church every weekend. We won't keep those people out, but, somebody, but this is an opportunity for us in a pretty simple way to reach out. I think it's important for us as a congregation. We're a pretty firmly established congregation now. I expect to see most of you every week or every two weeks and so God has brought us together uh, but it's important for us not to be so have so much fun together that we're not still reaching out and so we want to be focusing on this and so that's what we're planning to do on that day of September 15th now you might notice that we don't have a lot of room I'd like for us to have a goal of about 50 people or more on that day we can't realistically have 50 people in this room. So I've spoken with Pastor Deb over at Centennial, and on that day, our plan is to meet there in their middle room that is a bigger room than this with round tables, and we'll have a similar event to what we have on a normal Saturday, but we'll have a little more space for it, and we'll order in a meal as well to be part of our worship gathering on that day. So keep that in mind and be praying and thinking about who you could invite to be part of that. It's a pretty low threshold that we have for people coming in here. You can, you can be here just two weeks and feel like you're an insider. And I love that. I think everybody here except Lance is an insider today. So uh, <laughs> you come back next week, you'll be You'll be an insider too. <laughs> Amen. We want to look today at the scripture on the back of your handout as we continue to go through Mark's gospel. And if you would read these verses with me from Mark chapter 1, let's read them aloud. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men. Lord, as we look at your word today, break it open for us, and by your spirit, speak to us and give us ears to hear, so that we can know what your word is for each one of us today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you correct where you need to correct today. Correct me where I need to be corrected today. That you would bring us to a place of yieldedness and availability to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to just paint a picture for you as we look at this scripture. It says that Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. I don't know if there was a little shore road and he was just walking along the road. Or maybe there was a beach. I'm not sure how that was. But he was walking right along the shore. The Sea of Galilee was familiar territory for him. And he encounters two different sets of brothers. First of all, Simon and Andrew. And then in a few minutes after that, James and John. All of these four men were fishermen. That's what they did for a living. And it's interesting to note that although Mark doesn't say this, that Jesus had met at least Andrew and Peter, Simon, before. In John chapter 1, 
we can read the account, and I'm not going to read it in detail now, but it was a situation where Andrew had been a disciple of John the Baptist, and he, they were not in Galilee at that time, but down in Judea in a different area, and Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist, and one day Jesus walked by where they were, and, and John said, look, there is somebody you need to get to know. And he introduced them to Jesus, and they said, where do you live? And he said, come and see. And they spent from 4 o'clock in the afternoon for the rest of the day. Andrew and several others spent some time with Jesus. And then it says that Andrew went and found Simon and said to him, hey, here's somebody you need to meet. And so he introduced Simon to Jesus. So Simon all, or Jesus already knew these two brothers. They were, he was familiar with them. Also, on another occasion, right there somewhere nearby, Luke chapter 5 tells us that Jesus was preaching on the shore of Galilee and great crowds were pressing in on him and there were two empty boats at the water's edge and the fishermen were nearby. So Jesus stepped into one of the boats and it was Simon's boat. It was kind of a God moment. Simon was just washing his nets, preparing his nets. Jesus steps in the boat and say, Hey, friend, could you, could you accommodate me? And so Simon took him out in the boat and he spoke to the crowds. So both of these events had taken place before this day, from anything we can understand. Jesus knew these men. And so, verse 17, Jesus calls out to them, Come and follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. I will show you how to fish for people. The older translations say, I'll make you, I will show you how to be fishers of men, to fish for people. You don't think of that, but Jesus was just using some kind of a little metaphor there. And so for the rest of their lives, these four men would be fishing for people. Every now and then they fish for fish, but Jesus called them to a whole new season, a whole new chapter of their lives. And so they were then following him. And for three years he was more or less watching what Jesus did. They were watching what Jesus did. This is, we don't read Jesus anymore using that metaphor. But here's, they, they watched Jesus' ministry, and then after the day of Pentecost came, and they were full of the power of the Spirit of God, they spent the remainder of their lives telling people about Jesus, fishing for men. Um, so, their, their task, you know, their job involved fishing with nets. They did not use lines and lures and sinkers. But they were, they were net fishermen. It looks like they were probably similar to the kind of net fishermen that I grew up with in Nova Scotia. And they would have a net, and it was fastened on either end to a buoy, and then it was let down into the water, and, and then the fish kind of got their gills caught in the net. It might have been that kind of a net. It's possible that they also used something that I saw in Newfoundland a couple years ago, where you have kind of a circular net, maybe three feet or four feet around with weights on the outside of it and you kind of hold it and you throw it and you kind of spin it in a way like a frisbee I guess and then it lands on the water and it goes down and it's usually shallow water and you you then bring it in and you got fish in there. I, we saw some people in Nicaragua doing this in Lake Nicaragua as well. So anyhow they were guys who used nets Earlier this week, I was chatting with my friend Tim Lieber, and Tim will be back next week. It's kind of an interesting summer for him, but he'll be here. And we were talking about why is it important for us to be growing more and more like Jesus in our character? Yeah. Why is it important for us to, to be godly people? And he, he said, so that a lot of people will go to heaven. So I was thinking of that in a way. In a way, Tim is kind of like the lure, right? <laughs> Tim is kind of like 
bait. That's right, he's bait. And, and, and we love Tim, and we know a lot about Tim. Tim is pretty, I, I think he's always the same. He's always wanting to love on people and help people and serve people. And we, he's certainly been a blessing here. And his first thought was, well, I am, if I am that way, it's so that more people will go to heaven. So he's, he's kind of both a fisherman and the bait, both together. Um, so how do, we, how do we fish for men? It seems like it's a good thing, like Tim is saying, to live a godly life. None of us are perfect. All of us have flaws. Some of us don't even know how flawed we are. But can I just say that when we say yes to Jesus, when we welcome him to come into our lives and our minds and our hearts and to help us to, do, to live a life that pleases him, and he does that, there is a change that takes place. And maybe you've seen that in someone else's life, or maybe you've seen it in your own life, the before picture and the after picture and and some and if you have friends if they hang around you much they'll know something happened you know something happened to this guy what happened and it gives you then the opportunity to be your own self a fisher of men and to say you know it's not just because I want to be good not just because I want to clean up my act. It's not just because I don't want to do drugs anymore or to or that. We got to give a reason for it. And the reason is because Jesus. The reason is because of what he has done. There is an attractiveness to it. And I want to encourage you sometimes to think of yourself as a fisher of men, as a fisher for people. That's not always how we think of ourselves, but it's good for us from time to time to remind ourselves, even though I may not be a great extrovert, even though I may not, it may not be easy for me to sit down and talk with people, I do have a circle of friends, I do have some people I know, and I can be praying for them, I can be living a, a, a godly life before them, and I can, I can tell them about Jesus. And so I, I hope that we'll do that as part of our, our, of our, our lifestyle as followers of Jesus. Now I want to notice in verse 18, it says, it says about both of these that they left, it says in verse 18 about Simon and Andrew, they left their nets at once and followed him. And then later on it, he called uh, James and John, it says he called them at once and they also followed him. I want to think about that a second. I want to think about how, first of all, there was an immediate response. Uh, there was an, imme an immediate obedience. Someone has said that if you delay obedience, it's just like disobedience. And that's kind of true. There is this thing that the Lord is looking for in us of, of a rapid response him an immediate response to him and so the, immediately they left their nets and followed him <coughs> so these men were also available not only was there be with whoever that an ambulance is going to get watch over them so there was this availability these men left their employment to follow Jesus and it and I think it was kind of an open-ended thing. Good thing because they, they never really went back to that very much. Now, it, you know, the thing is, God doesn't call, Jesus didn't call all of his people to be that way. There were plenty of people who ended up being followers of Jesus and he didn't call them to, be, to hang out with him for three years. But it is important for us to be available. To be available. Are our ears open to hear God speaking to us? I want to think for a minute about this, about these two Greek words, and I won't get, try to get too scholarly on you because 
if I couldn't. But uh, there's two Greek words that are used for the word word. And, and the first one is logos. You're familiar with this? It's, the, it's, it's when, when God speaks like in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's logos. The word is logos. When we speak about God's written word, that is also the Logos. When we speak about Jesus Christ, he's described as the Logos. And there are a lot of times that that word Logos is used. I looked at this as well this week, and there are a lot of times when the word Rhema is used. And this is like an utterance. It's like a specific word to a person. And it's a complicated thing. It's more complicated than just the... And we'll maybe get into that sometime. But... But sometimes God speaks directly to me, Rick, and to you. And, and it's just a word for us for a moment in time. And I bet almost all of us have had this kind of thing too. You know? And sometimes it's just you need to help that person. And, and it's, it's not just our own natural instinct to do it. It may be that we would be reluctant to help that person, right? I don't want to help that person, but God, I know God is saying to me, you help that person. I, I don't want to speak to that person about Jesus, but, but the voice of the Spirit is saying to me, and he's not just saying it to everybody, he's saying it to you on that occasion. You go speak to that person and talk with them about Jesus. I remember one time I was in a church that was not my own church, and every now and then this happens, and God said, you need to tell, speak up and say something. He says, there's a woman here who has stomach issues, and I want to heal her. And you know, so you do that. So what's the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing was like, okay, that was not of God. That was just something I dreamed up. And you're kind of embarrassed by it. So... Can I just say, get ready to be embarrassed. It's okay to be embarrassed. But, so I did. And there was a woman there who had just, was, had seen several doctors and they were, she was being treated but it wasn't getting better. And so I had a lady lay hands on her and there was some thing there that I can't describe that went on and, and God really touched her and ministered to her and brought healing to her. And I'm glad I listened. And I'm glad that I obeyed. It's okay to get, you know, pie on your face. It's okay, can I just say, it's okay to get pie on your face nine times if the tenth time God really is saying something. Don't just let that be a discouragement to you. If you say, okay, God was saying this, but it doesn't seem like that was working out, don't worry about it. Maybe he's just bring you to a good place of humility in your life. That's right. A righteous man falls, but he gets back up. So we have several things here to think about. We have the thing to think about of being available to God, and we have this thing to think about of being willing to obey Him quickly, to obey Him immediately. May God help us to do that. As we go to our tables today, a couple of questions, and we just have five or ten minutes. How open are your spiritual ears when God speaks to you directly through the Logos Word, when you're reading the Scripture or when somebody is preaching or whatever? And how open are your spiritual ears when the Lord speaks directly to you with the Rhema Word? Let's have some discussion. God bless you as you talk at your tables today. I don't know where this church we're talking about.